Okay, welcome to day two. Today is all about technological advances um, and how those inventions made cultural impacts. Not a very long video at all. It'll probably, uh, it'll definitely be less than 10 minutes. So um, let's get on into it. So um, do you know what this is? This is a cotton blossom, and this plant changed the lives of so, so many people. England's cotton came from plantations in the southern United States during the 1790s. It took forever to remove the seeds by hand, plus it was really hard work. Eli Whitney, an American inventor, invented the cotton gin in 1793. This basic machine multiplied the amount of cotton that could be cleaned so that so much so that in 1790 American cotton production was about 1.5 million pounds to 85 million pounds in about 20 years. Now the cotton didn't pick itself um, and here's your first fact that you need to write down. The invention of the cotton gin increased the demand for slaves on American plantations. This chart shows you the direct correlation between the invention of the cotton gin and the demand for slavery. Both absolutely skyrocket. But look at how slavery was impacted between 1840 and 1860. Now, slavery was outlawed in Britain in 1833, but it wasn't until 1863 when slavery was outlawed in the United States. So we know for sure that the Industrial Revolution impacted the lives of Africans and those who were forced into slavery. Women and children especially were impacted by the Industrial Revolution. We've already talked about the end of the cottage system, um, that once factories were being built, the factory owners needed people to work in the factories and to run the machines and make the various goods and products. The cottage system was replaced by the factory system. Um, not necessarily, I mean, it was a good thing, but not not everything about it was good. So working conditions were terrible, absolutely deplorable. Um, here's an idea of what a day in the life of a child laborer would have been like. This is the testimony that was given to a parliamentary committee about the conditions of child laborers in the textile industry. This is according to William Cooper, who began working in a textile factory when he was 10 years old. The workday began at 5 a.m. William and his sister would wake up around 4 or 4.30 so they could be at work by 5. If they had breakfast to eat, it was eaten on the run to work. At noon, children would receive 40 minutes break for lunch. This is the only break they got all day. Kids often got tired and sleepy around 3 p.m. So in order for them to be awake for their shift, adults often whipped them. 6 p.m. came and went with no dinner break. Children would eat their dinners just as they had their breakfast on the run. At 9 p.m., William's shift ended. He was free to go home after working his 16-hour shift. His sister, however, had to work an additional two hours and still had to be back at work at 5 a.m. the next day. The wages were low because factory owners could pay women less than a man and children were paid only a fraction of what an adult would have been paid. Working conditions were also extremely dangerous. Um, many times workers were crammed into rooms with machinery and heavy equipment with only one door in or out. So if there were to be a fire, everyone would have to jam through one door. Air quality within the factories was terrible as well. Now, if you had been a man during the Industrial Revolution, Chances are you would have a difficult time finding a job to support your family. Men had to compete with women and children for jobs. And if I'm a factory owner and I can hire women and children for much less than a man, you better believe that that's going to be what I do. Because child labor equaled two things. It kept the cost of production low, which meant that profits would be high. Now, if you remember from the video we watched in class, we saw where children worked the coal mines. Officially, they started at age eight, but remember that unofficially, some children began working as early as three, between three and five years old. Finally, the Mines Act was passed in 1842. And what it did was prohibit females and children under the age of 10 from working in the mines. But still, 10 years old, 
that's hardly enough old enough to work in a coal mine. Now, the owners of the mines and factories exercised considerable control over their workers' lives. Oftentimes, they owned the tenement where the workers lived. They had major connections in the neighborhoods, and if a worker left the factory, they would often be kicked out of their tenement. They would pretty much be blackballed in the neighborhood, meaning that everyone would turn their backs on them, or in other situations like the mine owners, they would sell the candles to the miners, but they would jack up the prices so it wasn't fair at all to the workers. Okay, so that wraps up today. Um, some pretty bad living conditions that these people have had to deal with, um, but we're going to see where some um, good things do come out of it, and we'll see you next class.